Friction is a force that is all around us. It could be that there's not enough friction, like this boy slipping on the ice, or these dogs slipping on a smooth floor. Another way of saying not enough friction is to say not enough traction, like not enough traction between tires and a snow-covered road. We deal with friction every day, so the more we understand friction, the better we can use it to our benefit, whether it's to develop anti-lock braking systems. Or just for fun and sport. Friction allows geckos to walk on vertical surfaces. Rock climbers' shoes are made of high friction rubber so that they can grip a mountainside better. And we know that friction causes heat. Here, with the aid of an infrared camera that sees heat, a person warms his cold hands with friction by rubbing them together. Here's an outdoorsman using friction between a rotating stick and a piece of wood to start a fire. And here's a regular person using friction to light a match. These examples are only a small sample of how friction plays a role in almost everything we do. So here we're going to take a look at an example of a block sitting on a table, and then we're going to attach a string to it, and we're going to slowly increase the amount of pulling force until the block begins to slide. And we're going to analyze, using force diagrams, the forces acting on the block throughout that process. So here's the first step. We have this wooden block, and up here is my force sensing equipment with the LabQuest equipment. But if I don't pull on the block yet, it's just sitting on the table, block sitting on a table, we look at the forces acting on the block. We have the weight in the downward direction, the support force of the table, the normal force in the upward direction, and the block is at rest, so it's not accelerating. So we know the sum of the forces in the y direction equals to zero. My normal force is in the positive y, so it has a positive sign. My weight is in the negative y direction, so it has a negative sign. It adds to zero, and I see when I rearrange that equation that the normal force is equal in magnitude to the weight. No surprise there. Now, let's attach a string. I've put a string here. I've attached it to the force sensing equipment, and we're going to pull on the string. In other words, we're going to put some tension in the string. The block does not move initially. Even though I'm pulling on the string, the block is still at rest. So I know the sum of the forces in the x direction also must equal to zero because the block is not accelerating. The other force that cancels out the tension force, of course, is the frictional force. And when the block is not moving, when it is static, then we call that frictional force static friction. And it opposes the direction that the block would move if I pull on it with the string. That is a key idea. Friction always opposes motion. So my tension wants to cause the block to move to the right. The friction opposes that with a force to the left. And the sum of the forces in the x equal to zero. Here I've redrawn the force vectors all originating at the center of mass of the object. T is my tension. F sub S is my static frictional force. And the sum of the forces in the X equal to zero. If I say that the direction of possible motion to the right is my positive direction, then T is in the positive direction, so it's positive. The frictional force the static frictional force is in the negative direction, so it has a negative sign, and they add to zero. In other words, the tension and the frictional force have the same magnitude, but are in opposite directions. Now, what if I pulled harder on the string? Well, I can simulate that here by increasing the size of the vectors, and you see that as the tension vector grows, so too 
does the static frictional force vector. The static frictional force vector will continue to be equal in magnitude to the tension vector until a certain thing happens. What is that certain thing? Well, there is a maximum amount of static frictional force that can exist between this block of wood and this table based on a few things. We'll talk more about it later. But basically, it comes down to what are the two materials in contact, in this case, the wood and the tabletop. What are those materials? And how hard are they, are they being pressed together? That will be determined by how much weight is on top of the block plus the weight of the block. Based on those two things, the amount of static friction, there is a maximum amount that can be present. Once we break, uh, once we cause tension to be greater than that maximum static frictional amount, then the block will begin to move. Let's take a look at an example of when the block is still not moving and the tension is increasing, the frictional force also increases to match it and the block remains at rest even though the tension force is increasing. All right, here's our setup. We've got our block that's gonna slide on the table. On the top of it is my lab quest and my force sensors. They're gonna be along for the ride. The string pulls on the block, goes over the pulley, and here's a, right now, just an empty cup. And my funnel here, I'll take this cup of sand and I'll pour it into the funnel. It'll fall through the funnel and fill the cup so that the weight of the cup is constantly increasing, thus constantly increasing the tension on the string. And back here, the force sensor will measure the tension in the string. My lab quest will record the uh, force as a function of time graph. Okay, we're ready to go. I've got one camera filming the lab quest so we can see what's going on there at the same time that we perform the experiment. So right now, the tension in the string is equal to the weight of the cup. So that is 0.448 newtons. I'm gonna pour the sand in. It's gonna increase the tension. The static frictional force will match the tension force. We know that because the block isn't moving. Once the maximum static frictional force is exceeded, the block will begin to slide. Ready, here we go. So here's the graph that was generated by the LabQuest. Let's point out a few important spots on the graph. Here we go. This is the weight of the cup. So this is before I poured sand in the cup. This is the tension in the string just from the weight of the cup. Then as I poured sand into the cup, the weight of the cup increased. And so the tension in the string increased. And right up here, is where we reached maximum static frictional force and the cup began to slide and it did not slide for very long. This uh, jerky region in here is what the force, sensor, the force sensor read as it was sliding for a very brief moment. But this is the maximum amount of static friction and then the cup hit the ground and the tension in the string went slack. We're going to try another trial, but we're going to do it in a different way now. Instead of using a cup of sand to pull the block, I'm going to pull the string by hand. Once it starts to move, I am going to let up on the tension. I'm not going to pull as hard, and I'm going to get the block to slide across the table at constant velocity. If it's sliding across the, the table at constant velocity, that means its acceleration is zero, so the sum of the forces in the X add to zero, and now the frictional force is a kinetic frictional force as it slides across the table. So if I get the block to slide at constant velocity, then I know that the tension in the string is equal to the kinetic frictional force. So here we go. I'm increasing the pull. There, I've entered kinetic frictional force now. 
and there's our result. So here's a close-up look at the graph. I started to pull the force in the string. The tension got greater and greater up to the maximum static frictional force, which we see was about four newtons. Then the block began to slide, and I pulled so that the block moved with constant velocity. And in this region, we see the kinetic frictional force is only about 2.6 newtons. The force sensor jerks around a lot as the block slides. So what I did was here was take the average of all these uh, values, and that's what this is here, 2.58. But what we see here is that the kinetic frictional force is less than the maximum static frictional force, and that's always going to be true. So friction depends upon two main things. What are the two surfaces in contact with one another? What are they made out of? And how hard are they being pressed together? Changes to the texture of the surfaces, such as being rougher or smoother, and changes in the temperature, both of those affect friction, but for now we'll assume those don't change. Experimentation has shown that for two given surfaces, the ratio of the frictional force and how hard they're pressed together remains basically constant. So here is an experiment that you're going to do in lab next week. First, we're going to start off by looking at static friction. And what I've done is I've taken three different measurements. I have generated a graph, just like we've seen previously in the video, for three different weights. I'll do the block by itself, and then the block with some added weight, and then finally the block with even more added weight. So I get these three data points, and I'm graphing the amount of peak static friction or maximum static friction. So that's this value here on my graph, and I plot that on the y-axis as a function of the normal force. The normal force is a measure of how hard two surfaces are being pressed together. And when I make that graph, I see it as a straight line. And so the slope of that line is the ratio of the y-axis to the x-axis. So if Fs max is on the y-axis, the normal force is on the x-axis. So that ratio is the slope. And I give that a name. I call it the coefficient of static friction. And then I can rearrange that equation to show that the maximum static frictional force is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. I can do the same thing for the kinetic friction. Here is a, an, a, another experiment in which I ran three trials, and for each three trials, I added more weight to the block to give me a a different normal force. And then from each graph, I recorded the kinetic frictional force, which is this value here. And I made a graph with the kinetic friction on the y-axis, the normal force on the x-axis. And now the slope of the line is the ratio of the kinetic frictional force to the normal force. And as you might guess, we call that the coefficient of kinetic friction. And when we rearrange that equation, we see that the frictional force, the kinetic frictional force, is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. And of course, as we said before, here we see the kinetic frictional force about 0.25 and the static frictional force about 0.39. So like we said, the kinetic frictional force is always less than the maximum static frictional force. All right, so let's summarize what we've learned here. As a force pushes or pulls on an object that could slide across a surface, the frictional force is equal to the pull, pushing or pulling force, and that's called static friction. And as that force increases, so too does the static friction until we reach the maximum static frictional force, at which point, if greater force is applied, the object begins to slide, and the frictional force immediately drops to the kinetic frictional force, and that remains at about a constant value as the object slides across the floor. We also said that 
the kinetic frictional force is always less than the maximum static frictional force. And we learned about the coefficients of friction that says the static maximum static frictional force is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force, and the kinetic frictional force is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force.